Thank you very much, Sor, and thank you to the organizers for, uh, for giving this opportunity. So as historians of the, oh, sorry, that's feedback, yeah. As historians of the Jewish and Islamic communities of the Islamic world who turn to the documents of the Cairo Kinesa, we complement the detail, and I'll turn it off. Am I allowed yeah, now? Yeah. Yeah. I did. Awesome. So we, uh, we, we complement uh, the detail these documents provide by bringing to bear a broad range of sources, right? Other documentary materials from the Geniza, classical edited literary works such as chronicles, and Jewish and Islamic legal writing from a variety of genres that uh, run the gamut and at times bridge the gap between the aspirational and the descriptive. Part of the beauty of this endeavor is our attempt to synthesize these sources creatively, to fill in the gaps, to explain inconsistencies, and to stitch the materials together into a coherent story. Often, the Geniza materials open up to us a story very different from that of the Chronicles, with the position and interests of the writers of the Chronicles often greatly at odds with uh, those of the Geniza documents. Indeed, whether we consider the presentation of historical events by chroniclers or the self-presentation of what we might call micro-historical events by scribes and individuals in letters and documents, legal documents, it behooves us always to remain open to the presence of fiction in the archives. At times, legal documents, which we might otherwise imagine to be descriptive, turn out to be aspirational. Think, for example, of loan agreements in the Geniza, which record uh, the, uh, the party's intended repayment agreement on the recto and their eventual repayment on the verso, and at which Goitain explained that thus far we have never happened to find on the back of the document a full list of payments arranged according to the weeks or months as stipulated on the front. Of course, we might equally conjecture that even the recorded payments themselves don't capture the full picture, as a debtor might have handed over goods uh, or in lieu of specie, and have recorded the value of those goods, or done something else entirely. We simply don't know, and we can't know. Archaeological evidence can shed a little more light on this picture, and I would like to use my time today to show just how it would behoove those of us who rely on documentary materials to familiarize ourselves with archaeological data and analysis for the regions and periods which we study. I'll refer in particular to the work of two of our colleagues, Frankel and Roxandi Margariti, who have been fruitfully using the results of archaeological surveys and material finds to sharpen the picture drawn by Geniza documents and chronicles. Yet, since most of us are not trained in the field of archaeology, we may not even have an idea of how these resources may be of assistance to us in our efforts, and we often turn our attention elsewhere, just as many of us, myself included, have largely refrained from using mathematical or statistical methods to write social history. It took someone like Richard Bullitt to consider how we might use the mess of detail preserved in the Arabic prosopographical literature to use statistical methods in order to tell us something about the speed and progress of conversion to Islam in the early to high Middle Ages, if not necessarily much provable about the depth or penetration of those conversions within populations as a whole, per se, or someone like Jessica Goldberg. To, uh, to show how the numerical analysis of how Geniza traders use language about certain types of commercial arrangements might tell us something about how those traders divided their time or interests uh, across those various commercial arrangements. While Goldberg's work was preceded by somewhat anecdotal attempts to explain how those traders chose between so-called informal agency and formal partnership agreements, including that the vast majority of transactions relied on informal agency relations, Goldberg's study turned to a large number of documents to reveal the surprising result that the blend of informal and formal instruments was much more even than previously believed. This doesn't mean, of course, that the statistical data gleaned from documentary or literary materials are manifestly clear and that the conclusions one might draw are unimpeachable. On the contrary, roughly 99% of the scholars who have drawn on bullets conversion to Islam in the medieval period have misunderstood his timetable of conversion to depict the rate at which the denizens of Iraq, Iran, Syria, Tunisia, and Spain converted to Islam, whereas it does no such thing. That is to say, the data themselves may be unimpeachable, but one must interpret those data very carefully, lest one fall into the pitfall described by Nietzsche that the text has disappeared under the interpretation. <coughs> 
Now, the question of whether archaeological fieldwork should be driven by a textual narrative or whether text should simply be used to refine archaeological interpretation is an important one taken on by Bethany Walker in a recent article, What Can Archaeology Contribute to the New Mamlukology? But we may not even have the luxury of determining which direction archaeological fieldwork should go, let alone the training to direct it properly. Therefore, I think it most useful to consider the numerous ways that archaeological data and detail from material culture can complement our study of written materials. They can function at the local, or what I would call micro-historical level, identifying details concerning individuals, individual behavior, the reality of daily life, explaining more fully or indeed challenging phenomena we've identified in the Casey documents. Material culture can also serve at the intermediate level, filling in narrative gaps and shedding light on broader social and cultural institutions at the level of the city or the community rather than the individual. And they can also shed light on the macro level, allowing us to revisit our understanding about broad social aggregates and particularly helping us to understand questions of demography and urbanization with detail we might not otherwise be able to witness from the Geniza documents themselves. So I'll discuss some brief examples at each of these levels in the hopes of demonstrating the importance of evidence for, for material culture to social historians of every stripe. Now after highlighting some of the ways the material evidence can be used to complement written sources, I'll discuss how the distinct nature of the data sets used by archaeologists or analytic historians shape the narratives they produce. I will argue that whereas chronicles and even documentary sources lead us to oversample activity and change, <coughs> material remains have the very opposite effect, often reflecting developments in the long durée rather than individual events. This would mean that any effort drawing on one data set alone is artificially skewed, suggesting that turning to the physical evidence of material culture isn't a luxury, but in fact is an absolute necessity for those of us who consider ourselves social historians of the Geniza. Now to begin with the micro-historical level, I introduce an anecdote. Visiting the excavations at Tiberias with Katya Citrin Silverman of Hebrew University, I learned of a site on the periphery of the Islamic period city where a large number of sugar-related vessels were retrieved and which Citrin identified as a sugar factory. Thinking about this find brought to mind a document I had transcribed and translated a decade earlier in my dissertation, which drew on some preliminary analysis by Goitein in Appendix C of Mediterranean Society, uh, Volume 1, describing a partnership in which two brothers took on two other individuals as partners in a sugar factory. Goitein explained, that another document referring to the factory shows that part of its building was situated within the city precincts and another part outside of it. Chancing upon the sugar factory at Tiberias along the periphery of urban settlement, I realized not only that preparing sugar in the vessels found by Citrin would have generated fumes less than desirable in the urban center, but I could also hypothesize why this particular partnership included four partners, while many other agreements from the Geniza have but two. This foul-smelling work would have required extra capital to defray the costs of obtaining a dedicated workspace. And the participation of more partners would make this possible. This sort of work, connecting archaeological findings to Geniza materials, is exactly what Miriam Frankel and Ayala Lester do in their important recent article, Evidence of Material Culture from the Geniza, an attempt to correlate textual and archaeological findings, which discuss the list of items from daily life found in the Geniza. The point of the project, in their words, is to better understand, better our understanding of the social cultural implications of the use of various objects and of their grouping in a single list. In fact, in this article, the authors do more than simply correlate these different types of findings, but they use either type of materials to interpret the other. For instance, they use 14th and 15th century illustrations along with Poitain's discussion of kneading bowls to conclude that a metal bowl found in Tiberias is itself a kneading bowl, referred to as a Jaffna in the Geniza. In their work, Franklin and Lester are carrying on a long-standing tradition of using one set of materials to interpret the other. For instance, Mordecai Kiva Friedman suggested in his 2006 review of Lee Guo's work on the Poseidon al Padin documents that Geniza documents would have helped the author with the deciphering, translating, and analyzing the Red Sea texts. While there are very important distinctions to be drawn between these two corpora of documentary materials, there's little doubt that one might help interpret the other. Of course, 
where the two evidentiary corpora are continuous in time, place, and dramatis personae, the interpretive insights are still greater. Thus, in a recent article, which I wrote with our colleague Elizabeth Lamborn, an expert in material culture, the details of the development and dissemination of Chinese glazed porcelain uh, finds clarify a reading of a rabbinic query found in an India book document. And we were therefore able to make some conjectures concerning the flow of Chinese porcelain along the Red Sea route. It is here that we may step beyond the level of the individual person and the individual item in order to use archaeological detail in tandem with the Chinese materials to make claims at a higher level of abstraction, in this case the level of a community. It's in this vein that Roxani Margariti productively uses the 19th century British archaeological surveys of the Port of to reconstruct the topography of the medieval harbor there, even when the Giza documents are silent on many of the details. Now, Marguerite was assisted in this endeavor by passages from two medieval travel writers, but again, the topography of the harbor itself is missing from these accounts. Notably, Marguerite's reconstructions differ significantly from the current contours of the harbor, reminding us of the great importance of matching our textual witnesses to the reality of the period from which they emerge. Further, even artistic representations demand the very sort of careful reading we apply to literary and documentary materials. Marguerite points out that the early modern European illustrations of the Port of Aden contain stylized elements reminding us of both the limitations of artistic rep representation as a historical document and the delightful aid that such representation can lend to urban reconstructions. In addition to the topography of the medieval port, Marguerite musters archaeological data to describe some of the human institutions, many of which relate to the functioning of the port as a trading hub. Much as I learned of the sugar factory in Tiberias located on the periphery of urban settlement, Marguerite adduces industrial production such as tanneries to have sat on the littoral margin of the port with the customs house at the core of urban settlement and smaller shops in between. Again, Marguerite's work gives us a window into the structures at the communal or what I would call intermediate level rather than the individual level as we see in the work of Franklin Lester. Finally, it is at what I would call the macro or societal level, allowing us to draw abstractions even larger than that of a particular geographic, religious, or professional community that the archaeological evidence may be of greatest utility. Chronicles and letters do occasionally shed light on questions such as population size, demographic shifts and migrations, urbanization, and the like. Indeed, travelogues have long been mined to provide us with indications of population size and composition. Yet it must be admitted that even without uh, the uh, manifold problems in the manuscripts of these works, which make determining any sort of meaningful population size a challenge, travel writers no less than chronicles write with an audience in mind. Even if we believe that these writers actually visited the places they describe, there's little reason to presume the figures they present are accurate. Where it is available, archaeological detail can provide an order of magnitude check on the detail provided by travel writers and chronicles. Factors such as the economic carrying capacity of uh, a particular region may be brought to bear, where we may infer the geographic limits of settlement, and the detail provided by the archaeological finds will only continue to help us in this area as medieval accounts of plague, famine, and the like will be able to be confirmed with the scientific analysis of material residue. Yet the archaeological data are most interesting, perhaps, when the picture they present is one entirely different from that found in the literary sources. In their 2011 article, Egyptian Courseware in Early Islamic Palestine Between Commerce and Migration, Itamar Taxel and Alexander Fantalkin identified the presence of courseware basins in the land of Israel, which were produced in the Lower Nile Valley between the mid-7th and 10th century, which might have been understood as indicating international commerce, but which in their estimation suggests the storage of foodstuffs in the land of Israel by a population which originated in Egypt, since the morphological characteristics of those basins make their identification as a desirable commercial product unlikely. The presence of these basins suggests the migration of a number of Egyptian merchants and or soldiers from west to east, perhaps to maintain the local garrisons that protected Palestinian coastal cities from Byzantine invaders. Despite this, as Taxel and Fantalkin point out, the contemporary literary sources, however, 
rarely mention persons of Egyptian origin with regard to Palestine. Although pyrite from the Umayyad period do mention workers and craftsmen from Egypt who worked on the mosques of the Temple Mount, the archaeological evidence gives voice to the working class, which is often silent in chronicles. Indeed, whereas Islamic chronicles might suggest that the demands of conquest brought soldiers from east to west, and the North African prosopographical literature from the 9th century and thereabouts does indeed mention a few individuals who came, particularly from the Arabian Peninsula westward, the archaeological data bring to light a demographic shift in the very opposite direction. Again, this example demonstrates the utility of these data beyond our study of individuals or local institutions to the regional level. Finally, I would like to ponder for a moment how archaeological data and detail from material culture might structurally differ from chronicles and documentary materials and show that that difference might be significant for those of us who consider ourselves historians of the long durée. First, every scholar of the Geniza knows that documents in our treasure trove describe the lives of individuals situated in a very different place on the social and economic spectrum than the elites, who are the focus of literary chronicles. Tax on Fantal can remind us of this when they discuss archaeological data. But the problems in interpreting archaeological data are a bit different from those of interpreting literary or documentary data. The element of self-presentation is diminished in archaeological data, and the interpretive art is instead situated in filling in the narrative gaps, which are the very focus of literary data. That is to say that whereas chronicles and documentary materials alike focus on recording events and actions, requiring the researcher to attempt to separate the wheat from the chaff, the material remains require the researcher to discern what events or actions might have precipitated the archaeological record. Material remains call for an interpretation that can connect the dots, so to speak. And in the absence of narrative detail, the best the researcher can do is to refrain from introducing conjectures that draw anything other than a straight line between those dots. The archaeological record provides an echo of the very sort of detail presented by analytic histories, but without the annals themselves, all the archaeologists can do is connect the dots, connect the echoes. One might say then that historians relying on the results of archaeological and material culture research are necessarily predisposed to presenting a picture of greater stasis than, uh, than the colleagues who rely primarily on literary or even documentary materials. This is not only because the archaeological record might give voice to a stratum of individuals ignored by analytic histories, although as I've said, this is the case. Rather, I assert here that there is a methodological predisposition of material culture to preserve a picture of stasis, while the corresponding predisposition of chronicles is to preserve a picture of activity and change. It's worth mentioning as well that where the archaeological record does reflect change, that change will tend to focus on broad social aggregates which are independent from the analytic detail. Yes, events such as Islamic conquest did impact the Near Eastern city, but as Hugh Kennedy points out in his seminal article from Polis to Medina, many of the features which are often associated with the coming of Islam, the decay of monumental buildings and the changes in the classical street plan, are in evidence long before the Muslim conquests. While the Guinness documents might allow us to peek into the long durée, the archaeological material takes this to another level. Of course, the difference in perspective means that archaeologists need analytic materials to discern the social and economic forces which might have been responsible for the changes that we can see. But those of us who are otherwise not trained to engage material evidence can and must rely on these data to avoid telling a story which overemphasizes the effect of events, particularly those at the level of social elites, upon society and the built environment which it occupies. Generally, have a tendency 
whereas many of the documentary sources from yeah. Syriza are only accidentally written, as it were. They are not. Yeah. They don't have an agenda. Is there a distinction, or is that so? So, Professor Reif, I will give you an example that I often use with my undergraduates. Uh, I teach a place called Vanderbilt University, where many students. Um, maybe come from the upper echelons of the American economic spectrum, and on the weekends they often engage in recreation. And I asked them to consider the emails that they sent to their parents about how hard they worked over the weekend, right? And to contrast that with the text messages on their cell phones, which describe what they do on Friday and Saturday night. Does, does that respond to your question a little bit? Yeah. But, but I think, and again, my example from the loan agreements uh, right, shows something that's aspirational. It is documentary, uh, but it is, it is, again, nonetheless aspirational. But I would say even in the, the case of letters, that that element of self-presentation is there. Now, I would say also the element of self-presentation is present in the archaeological and material culture record. And I think Professor Frankel did an outstanding job of pointing out how that, that really is present and how material uh, uh, objects do uh, reflect our self-presentation. But the, the concern is there in the documentary materials as well, and I think we need to be very careful about that. We don't know what really happened. Uh, thank you, Phil. This was uh, amazing. And compliments the uh, viewer of the production, so to speak. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I love the distinction between you know, the you, you point very well to all the 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 nooks and crannies that are the between documents and material culture. But I want to push it forward and try to overcome this distinction in a way. And, and try to look at both of them as material culture. I think this was presented in Marina's talk very nicely the last few talks. And, and Marina has an advantage in it here. Because you come from a point where the documents are material culture first and text second. And a way to overcome this distinction would always be to turn to usages. I mean, how these texts or materials were used. And then you have a broader cultural picture of both, in a, whole, a more wholesome view and other distinction between two different sources. I could agree with you more. I thought that uh, you know Professor Rustav's talk last night really did speak to the sort of materiality of these documents. And so, uh, you know, the, so uh, I think you're right. But because many of us are trained with uh, you know, traditional philological techniques, right? We are perhaps augmenting that now, but I want to suggest that there can be a further methodological direction that we really need to go, and again, particularly as I'm interested in right now in my current project about questions of aggregate movements, right? That the, uh, you know, the, the uh, archeological you know, materials in their definitional context are particularly important. But you're right, we need to think about the documents themselves as Material culture, and we think about the zits and living can help absolutely. Thank you.